Hey coaches, welcome back to Coaching Mastery in the third video in our free video series where we're going way beyond the X's and O's and into the heart and mind of leadership, mentoring, and taking our athletes and teams to the next level. If you're new to the series, my name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the founder of the Changing the Game Project and the author of the books Changing the Game and Is It Wise to Specialize. Over the last week, we've been exploring what great coaching looks like and how to educate the parents on your team so that they can become your biggest supporters and buy into what the team and their kids are doing. We're doing this so that you can go back to your athletes and your teams and serve them better, become a person of positive significance in your players' lives, and hopefully win a championship or two while you're at it. If you've missed the first two videos in our series, you missed a ton of good stuff, including interviews with an English Premier League sport performance coach, and a lesson on conflict resolution with parents from a professional mediator and conflict resolution expert. So after this video is done, you can click above and watch the first two videos of our series. Because as you can see below, the comments and rave reviews have been flying in. You don't want to miss them. Now, in today's video, we're going to explore how you can build successful teams and programs in your communities so that you not only win more games, but you can develop better athletes and better people in the process. I've never met a coach who has said, nah, I don't want good culture or accountability on my team. <laughs> yeah, right. This is what we all strive for. Players that have high standards and hold each other accountable so that we don't have to. But that culture starts with us the coaches, and we have to be very intentional about creating it and maintaining it. That's why in today's video, I'm going to teach you about one thing that many coaches fail to do when building their teams. When they fail to do this, it doesn't allow a true culture of excellence to emerge. And here's a hint, it's kind of counterintuitive, and that's why so many coaches ignore it. But allowing this one thing to happen can make or break your team building process. And after I'm done teaching, I'm going to show you some clips from two interviews I've recorded with experts on building championship teams. First, we're going to hear from Mike Zigarelli, author of the amazing book, The Messiah Method, who's going to talk about a few of the things Messiah men's and women's soccer have done to win 15 NCAA national titles since the year 2000. Then I'll be joined by Dr. Jerry Lynch, founder of Way of Champions and one of the most sought after sports psychologists in the world. Dr. Lynch has been part of 34 NCAA championship teams, and he's going to share with us a few gems from his decades of experience working with top coaches and athletes. The best part is I've asked these two experts for tips that you can take with you and use on your teams so that you can win more games and build your own championship culture. You don't have to coach at Duke or North Carolina or Messiah College to do what Mike and Jerry are going to teach you. In fact, you can start right after this video changing the way your team works and acts. Now, before we jump in here, I think it's really important to reiterate that the difference between average coaches and great ones is not how many binders you have filled with practices and drills. Yeah, of course, that stuff's important, but truly elite coaches are able to push their players harder and get their team to consistently perform better because they understand leadership and team building, because they know how to form authentic connections with players, and they get to know them as a person, not just a pair of hands or a pair of feet. And whether you love them or hate them, coaches like Pep Guardiola, Jose Mourinho, Mike Krzyzewski, John Wooden, Pat Summit, these coaches were first and foremost great at connecting with their players as people, and not simply as athletes. They don't connect because they win. They win because they're great at connecting and motivating and mentoring athletes. Coaching mastery is all about teaching you those same things so that you can have the same results with your players and your teams and become a transformative figure in their lives. Okay. Let's get started. So there are four stages of team development. And perhaps for some of you, this is a review. And for others of you, this is the first time that you're hearing this. But either way, these four stages are really critical to know and understand. And today we're going to focus on one stage in particular. Now the four stages of team development are called forming, storming, norming, and performing. And these terms were coined in 1965 by psychologist Bruce Tuckman. I just want to explain them quick, and then we're going to really get in depth on one of them. Now, the forming stage is when you first select your team and you bring them together. And in this stage, most of the team members are positive and polite. Some are excited. Others are anxious. as They haven't really 
fully understood what the team's going to do. And as a leader, you can play a dominant role at this stage because the roles and the responsibilities are not yet clear and they're looking to you to help them define them. Now the next phase is storming. And this is a stage where so many teams fail and the one that we're gonna go into in a bunch of depth here in a bit. Now people start to push against the boundaries and against each other in this phase. And there might even be conflicts between team members over things like work ethic and attitudes and their roles on the teams, the position they play or the influential positions they get such as taking free kicks or taking the last shot in a game. Some people on the team might start to question the worth of the team's goals and they may resist taking on roles because they don't like them or they haven't had their say in who has those roles. And so we're going to come back to this phase in a second. So let me just explain the last two first and then we'll come back to storming. Now the next phase is norming. And this is when people start to resolve their differences, appreciate teammates' strengths, and to respect you as a leader and really the overseer of the team culture. They begin to accept their roles and they get to know one another better. They may even socialize more and they start to find common ground after a very stormy and conflict-filled part of team development. People develop stronger commitment to the team goal and most importantly in great teams, they'll begin to hold each other accountable for reaching those goals. And then the final phase is the performing stage. And this is when your team really starts playing well, when they all have buy-in and accountability amongst team members in pursuit of this common goal. Now as a leader, you can delegate a lot of your things in this stage to your team leadership, and you can concentrate on developing individual members within the team structure and being the ultimate keeper of the culture, you might call it. Now this is the best part of being on a team for players, and I think also for coaches. It's easier to coach because you really kind of just get to step out of the way and let your team roll. You're the facilitator. And it feels easy to be a part of a team at this stage. And if you've taken teams to this stage, you know, for me and my personal experience, it feels like you just kind of get out of the way and, and let them have at it. So now let's jump back into the storming phase because this is where so many teams fail. Now, one of the biggest issues is that many coaches despise conflict and questioning of the team goals and especially questioning their authority or decision making and so the storming phase of team development never happens but let me tell you this it has to happen i can promise you this rarely do successful teams not have this storming phase whenever you add new team members say you graduate some players or you bring in new ones to your team the whole process repeats itself that's why in a high school or a college team where you change out members every year, it's really hard to continue to have success because you might have talent and you might feel like you have the leadership. But if you have new team members and you don't allow your team to go through the storming phase, they may never come together in pursuit of that common goal, which you know is necessary to achieve that championship, to achieve that successful season. So here's a few ideas for you as a coach to help your team through the storming phase. Now, number one, explain this concept, right? Explain forming, storming, norming, performing process so that the players understand that this is okay and that this is supposed to happen. And if they work hard at this, things are going to get better. Most people never understand this. The next thing is establish a structure and give the team beginning with the leadership but eventually working on down the line give them ownership of the team goal setting process this is key to establish your team core values that everyone has had a say in adopting them because then they're ultimately going to buy into them even if they didn't necessarily agree with that value because they've had their say they're far more likely to buy in to what your values and what your goals are you must also build trust and good relationships amongst your team members. And when conflict arises, work hard to resolve it quickly. Don't leave team meetings, conflict-filled meetings open-ended. Deal with issues as part of the process, but get them resolved. 
The next thing is just remain positive. Remain positive to people who challenge your your leadership, who challenge the team leadership and the team's agreed upon goals because this is going to happen. But if you remain positive and remain the person with the bigger vision, you will get through that. And to do this, you got to never stop leading. You have to teach your team how to resolve conflicts. You have to teach your players how to resolve conflicts and see the bigger picture. Now, I realize this is a really brief overview, and it's something that we speak about much more in depth in in our full Coaching Mastery course, but I cannot stress enough how important it is to allow the storming phase to happen on your teams and to be the strong leader and lead your team through this process. Because when you go through this, you come out the other side much stronger, more focused, more motivated, and more accountable group of athletes who are in pursuit of one common goal. And these are the types of teams that are the most fun to coach. Great. So now that we have discussed one huge team building killer, the failure to allow our teams to go through the four stages of team development, let's see what some of the great coaches and programs do. Our first guest is Michael Zigarelli, author of The Messiah Method, The Seven Disciplines of America's Winningest College Soccer Program. He's also a professor of leadership at Messiah College, so he has had an inside look at how these two programs have dominated NCAA Division III soccer since the year 2000, winning 15 national titles and appearing in a further four title games, pretty much being the programs that everyone is trying to emulate in their title runs. He's going to give us some great insight that you can take back to your programs. So take a listen. What could any coach take and learn from Messiah and do with their own team or their own program? Well, here's uh, my my favorite quote from the book. It's from Dave Brandt, again, the chief architect of this this system. He said, um, and, and this applies to every leader, he said, if you don't like what's happening on your team, it's your fault. Mm-hmm. If you don't like what's happening on your team, it's your fault. I mean, that, that is chilling when you, when you think about it because we tend to blame players for their dysfunctions or for being lazy or not working hard enough or, or whatever. You know, they're just not improving. But he's saying, no, it's the coach. Right? And, and that assumption is that we can identify the problems and we can fix the problems. But we just don't as coaches. We don't work hard enough. But once you accept this principle of if you don't like what's happening, it's your fault, that, that's essentially an end to laziness for the coach. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's an end to, to excuses. I mean, my guys aren't stepping hard enough to the ball and you know, they're turning away from tackles or something like that. That's my fault. Mm-hmm. That's not primarily their fault. Now, I have to go and, and change that. I have to go and train that. I have to be intentional about it. I have to be incessant about it because if it doesn't change, it's primarily on me. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, that, that's both liberating and, and daunting, I think, for, for any leader out there. But regardless, that's been really transformational. Don't like what's happening on your team. You look to the mirror first. Yeah. But Coach Brandt could be this great person of positive significance, yet also ple- uh, be very disciplined. You know, well, why is he able to do that? And what can our coaches learn from from that? Well, I think, I think he cares mm-hmm. about the guys as, as people, mm-hmm. right? Just like Coach Fry on the girls' side cares about the girls as people. And and they know that. I mean, at first, I mean, the, the guys will tell you, Coach Brown's really intimidating. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're downright scared. If you do something <laughs> wrong, you're going to hear about it, mm-hmm. right? And sometimes it might be kind of loud. But these are 18 to 22-year-old guys who um, they're, they're in college and people who need to be pushed if they're going to, to reach their potential. So context matters there. But the, the, the broader context is we, we have a relationship. And you know I care. And I'm committed to you. You're part of this family. And I'm not going to cut you. You have a uniform for four years. So what we're doing is for the good of the team, and it's, and it's good for you too. Mm-hmm. Right? And so as soon as they turn that corner and they recognize that this is for the greater good, then it's, it's much easier to accept. But without that relationship, you know, unless I believe that you really care about me and have my best interests in mind, then I'm going to hear it as, as bullying. I'm yeah. going to hear it as badgering. I'm going to, I'm going to hear it as, as background noise or something like that. And it will not necessarily influence me in a positive way. And when and I speak... fake that. What's that? I said you can't fake that. I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but some, some people, they, they'll, they'll be a bit inauthentic about it. Yeah. And, and it'll be a, like a tactic for them. 
let me take this guy out for uh, for a coffee or drink or whatever and you know get to know him a little bit but they don't really care it's just a means to this end of getting them to work harder right that becomes transparent and people eventually see through that and then then they resent you for it Right. So it it really does start with the heart. If I care about these people, then a lot else will positively flow from it. Yeah. Um, you know, is is there anything else that that comes to mind? Anything else you'd like to say about your work with um, Messiah and, and sort of watching them year after year? You know, in, in front and center that the coaches who are listening in here can, can learn from this program and can learn from the coaches there and, and, and take back to their own programs? Well, yeah, I guess I'd say what, what's driving these teams is not just a desire to be the best or to get the trophies or the accolades. There's a purpose beyond themselves and there's a purpose beyond winning. And I mean, any team with Messiah across its chest, that, that purpose is going to be out there pretty obvious for everyone to see. But but for them, playing for this larger purpose is is really motivational. Uh, plus, it makes them more selfless and, and more unified mm -hmm. and uh, sort of develops this, this cohesion or this chemistry and, and this mindset on a team that's very difficult for other teams to replicate. It simply doesn't happen when we're focused on our own stats. Mm -hmm. But getting there to that larger purpose, to that larger mission, that's the coach's job. That's the leader's job. You develop the mission, you develop the vision, the, the, the broader picture that puts that larger purpose at the center, and then you hammer that home every week. It has to be there in front of people. Otherwise, they're just going to drift back to that individualistic mindset. And the culture, excuse me, the leaders drive the culture, and then the culture drive the, drives the results. But if it's, if it's about something bigger than themselves, then that, that also is a key to success. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Our full interview was just an amazing talk. I love the idea that as a coach that if you don't like it, fix it. If there's a problem with the culture, the attitude, the training, don't complain about it. Do something about it. This seems so simple, but so few coaches do this. I also love the idea that great cultures play to a higher standard, a higher purpose than winning. This is not an easy one, but I've always loved that John Wooden definition of success. Success is the peace of mind, which is a direct result of satisfaction in knowing that you did your best to become the best you are capable of becoming. What is your higher purpose? Maybe it's time to sit down with your team and define what success looks like. All right, so let's keep rolling with Dr. Jerry Lynch. I have to say that of all the interviews I've done, this one has gotten so much great feedback from our Coaching Mastery participants. Dr. Lynch has not been a part of 34 NCAA champions by accident. He's an intentional coach with a philosophy that is focused on what he calls the heart of leadership and the heart of coaching. In this short clip, Dr. Lynch is going to give us some great insights into how to turn around a program that's struggling and how to make a good program into a great one. The best part is there are things that you can be doing with your teams too. So just take a listen. Right. We have coaches uh, on this course, you know, some work at levels where they have, you know, maybe they're bringing in Jerry Lynch or someone like yourself to work with their team and help with their culture. If they're not in that type of situation, um, what are one or two things that everyone listening here can do to start intentionally improving the culture of their program, you know, tomorrow, today, when they watch this? What, and, and again, it's not a, we know it's not a one-time thing. It's not a one-week thing. It's a consistent thing. But, but what are, where, where, where does someone start saying, I don't like the culture here and I need to fix it? Well, I think you have to identify what it is you don't like in order to fix it. So uh, don't just say I don't like it and start complaining and <laughs> creating drama and whining about it. Find out what it is, and you said this before, find out what it is that you don't like and change that. Yeah. You know, because you, you, you're wise. I mean, if you're listening to this, you have some wisdom, and, and, and your wisdom says, you know, I don't like this. We're not having enough fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, Wow. How could I then create fun so you could become proactive instead of being reactive? Mm -hmm. and, and so you've got to identify the things in your culture, in, in the community of where you're coaching that really aren't working. So you become a detective and you figure it out and, and then you say, okay, here's two things or here's three things that I'm, I'm going to work on changing. If it's the fun factor, ah, that's a slam dunk. You could 
the kids aren't having fun, they're going to be done. Mm-hmm. And that That's as clear as can be. And that's why all these kids are dropping out. And, and if you ask a bunch of kids, why are they not enjoying what they're doing and why don't they like sport? It's because we're not having enough fun. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm saying for all of us, if I go into a group of people, that's my team. That's my culture, even if it's only for three hours, and then I leave. I'm trying to figure out why they look bored. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out why this isn't working. Mm -hmm. And I need to identify that real quickly, and I need to shift it and change it. Maybe I'm talking too much Mm -hmm. in this group. So maybe what I've got to do is maybe I've got to do more group activity. Maybe they need to be more involved. Maybe I'm not involving them enough. You know, so you look at your team as a coach. Maybe you're not involving the entire team together. And maybe you're not, you know, maybe there are a lot of kids that are disgruntled because they're not getting this. And maybe, so you need to do an assessment. And then you need to take the top two or three items that you feel are not working and fix them. Mm -hmm. Change them. I mean, if it's not working, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I look at it. It's my fault. If it's not working, I'm doing something. Um, Or I'm not doing something that I need to be doing. Mm -hmm. So I have a good question that that all coaches that might want to consider asking Mm -hmm. along these lines, John, that that you're bringing up. Uh, I love doing this with a team. Let's say you want the team to be more – let's say you want your culture to be more uh, more connected, to have more uh, uh, bonding. To, to have more uh, cohesiveness or to have more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, unity. Unity. Mm-hmm. There we go. Let's, let's use unity. Mm-hmm. If, if, you, if you assess that your culture does not have enough unity and you need to have that, ask the kids. I don't care how old they are. Mm-hmm. And say to them this. Number one, first question is, hey kids or hey team, what do we need to start doing that we're not doing in order to have more unity. Mm-hmm. And then you have this conversation. Mm-hmm. You can break them up into small groups of five and then have them report back in. The second question is, and it's the obverse of that, is what do we need to stop doing mm-hmm. that we are doing mm-hmm. in order to have more, more unity? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay? So you can take any, any part of your culture that's not working whether it's unity, whether it's uh, competitiveness. So we ask the same question with competitiveness. What do we need to start doing we're not doing to be more competitive? Mm-hmm. What do we need to stop doing that we're doing in order to be more competitive? Mm-hmm. And boy, I'll tell you, the answer lies within. All these kids, athletes, they'll give you stuff that you won't believe. And then you start implementing those things, their suggestions, and before you know it, you're, you have a culture shift that's almost, almost immediate. Yeah. I've seen it happen. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a miracle. Yeah, two 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 questions that that can change everything. Um, change the whole landscape. Yeah, and and then what? And then the then maybe the 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 third one is, all right, we've identified these things. Now, what are we willing to do each and every day to make those things go away? To mm-hmm. make those, you know, and to make these other things appear. That's that's uh that's powerful stuff. That's a great a great thought to end on. Yeah. Wow. All I can say is, wow, I love Jerry Lynch. The man is so full of insight and wisdom, and I wish I had him around some of the teams that I played for. I hope you've enjoyed video three of our Coaching Mastery free video series. If you've liked everything you've seen here, all the interviews and teaching on culture building and developing high-performing athletes and teams, you're going to love what comes next because we have barely begun to scratch the surface of what it takes to truly become a master coach and transformational leader. In a couple days, I'm going to send you a fourth video where I'm going to tell you how you can take your coaching to a whole new level and influence your players in such a profound way that they will compete harder and play better than ever before. If you have enjoyed the short clips from some of our expert interviews, you will love the full one-hour versions of those interviews. If you have a list of topics that you wish were covered in traditional coaching courses but are not, then keep an eye out for our next video because I'm going to tell you all about our full coaching mastery course and how you can secure one of the spots in our 2015 course. I ran this course for the first time in 2014 and every seat was filled. So keep an eye out for video four so that you don't miss out. In the meantime, please share these videos with any coaches you think would benefit from them. 
leave any comments or questions that you might have below this video. And I'd especially like to hear your thoughts on what was your biggest takeaway from the interviews with Mike Zigarelli and Jerry Lynch? Was there anything that really hit home for you? So please share your thoughts below and share this with any coaches you think would love this type of stuff. And check your email in the next few days for information regarding our full coaching mastery course. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon.